uh, I know Roger uh, as one of the uh, best scientists working in the pharmacological field in general, uh, to the point that even I was trying to recruit him to Cleveland. Uh, he was in Michigan at the time, but uh, he was smarter and rejected me completely and went to San Diego. So Roger, uh, Roger really is one of those fantastic scientists who contributes continuously throughout his career, but he's also a thought leader. The, the, the new concept and the way how to look at the pharmacological issues uh, really impressed me immensely. So I'm so delighted, Roger, you're here. And now let's move to Avery, uh, who will introduce you more formally. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm sure everybody is pretty familiar with Dr. Sunahara's work in G-protein biochemistry, but um, I think it really began at University of Toronto under the direction of Philip Seaman, where he was instrumental in, in cloning numerous dopamine receptors and even showed how antipsychotics can actually impact their function. And then after graduating, he uh, trained as a postdoc under the direction of Nobel laureate uh, Alfred Goodman Gilman at UT Southwestern, where he not only published the crystal structure of G-protein subunit alpha, but also helped define the mechanism behind adenylyl and guanylyl cyclase functions. And after a successful postdoc, he moved to University of Michigan, as Chris had said, and after a successful uh, stint as an independent investigator there, uh, he then moved to UCSD, I think, five years ago, where he is currently a full professor at the Department of Pharmacology and also an associate director of the Center for Drug Discovery and Innovation. Uh, he has numerous awards and honors and trained extensive number of graduate students and postdocs and served on numerous editorial boards, including JBC, Biochemistry and Frontiers in Pharmacology. So we, uh, I definitely look forward to hear, hearing his talk today, where I think he's highlighting recent work on monoamine receptors. So, uh, thank you. Well, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much for the invitation to, uh, to speak and also um, it's nice to meet you all. So um, let's see if we're going to switch to um, my presentation here. Let's see if it's working. All right, can you see that? Everything okay. Great, so my lab's interested in uh, g protein decoupled receptors and, and, and um, more trying to integrate some of the molecular pharmacology into the structure and trying to understand from a structural perspective how certain drugs work and how even hormones um, bind and how they end up activating them and initiating the signaling uh, cascade. So today I'd like to talk, talk to you about, um, it's a culmination of a number of projects, but it's really sort of helping us uh, understand now how drugs bind and how they um, stabilize conformations of GPCRs. And <clears throat> it extended a little bit further. We, we had sort of an unexpected finding and we were, we were characterizing the basic behavior of drugs. And it turns out that a lot of these particular qualities of, of these drugs end up being shared by hormones, natural native hormones. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about it because it's going to involve what we call the vestibule in G-protein um, coupled receptors. So as many of you know, I probably don't have to go through these introductory slides, the GPCR is incredibly important for regulating the physiology. It's obviously regulating um, cardiovascular uh, parameters, really important in the brain, um, in the immunology, and of course, um, you all know that they're incredibly important for sensory perception. And you also know that um, GPCRs are cell surface receptors. They receive signals, extra, extracellular, in most cases, signals. In, could be in the form of light, could be in the form of hormones or drugs. And they are, are able to, to uh, translate this information, the stimuli, into the cell and regulate effectors such as ion channels or adenyl cyclase or phospholipase C, which can regulate, of course, second messengers. And they do so by coupling through these intermediary proteins, G proteins. 
what's interesting about cheap, cheap protein coupled receptors is that there are a lot of them. There are um, about 800, a little over 800 um, genes that encode GPCRs in the human genome. Um, many of them are sensory receptors, but um, a lot of them uh, are um, recognize um, hormones and, and, and chemokines. And they're scattered through the, through the chromosomes. And because there are so many of them, and because there are so, they're so, so important in physiology, they turned out to be fantastic targets for therapeutics. And, and this is sort of getting old now, but um, three years ago, um, uh, a review was performed by basically the Overington Group, where they determined that at least 33% of all therapeutics currently sold in the market target GPCRs. So of the many GPCRs that we could have the option to work on, we sort of focused on one receptor, the beta adrenergic receptor, a lot of historical reasons. One, it was the first receptor to be uh, cloned and basically purified. Um, I'll take that back. Um, hormone receptor to be cloned and purified. But also, um, it happens to express quite well. And you can make um, you can make it recombinant sources, so a lot of mutagenesis studies have been done. And also, it's a fantastic uh, therapeutic target, so there are lots of drugs available for the beta adrenergic receptor. So the beta-2 receptor um, couples to G-proteins, as I mentioned, and the primary G-protein it couples to is the stimulatory G-protein, GS, but it's also capable of coupling to the inhibitory G-protein, GI, as well as interacting with the um, scaffolding proteins, and most notably arrestin. But we're not going to talk about that today. So, really, my, a lot of the work in my laboratory has been focused on the coupling of, of the beta adrenergic receptor to its cognate G protein GS. And we've been sort of using this as a, as a model for many GPCRs, trying to understand how ligands bind and how the conformational changes that occur in the receptor, which end up activating G protein. And, and initiating this signal, signaling cascade. So there are three beta adrenergic receptor subtypes, main subtypes, the beta 1, beta 2, and beta 3. And from this sequencing alignment, you can see that the transmembrane domains in particular are very, very, very similar uh, between these three isoforms. So the beta adrenergic receptor's most important function, I would say, is in, is in the sympathetic response. And um, so uh, it's part of, part of the autonomic uh, nervous system. Um, the hypothalamus can regulate and activate um, the adrenal glands to secrete, produce, and also secrete epinephrine and norepinephrine. And once that's in the bloodstream, um, it ends, you end up getting um, strong effects of epinephrine, norepinephrine on the heart, um, causing chronotropy, ionotropy, geometropy, lucitropy, all for the performance of trying to get better um, circulation. Similarly, you get you end up um, epinephrine, norepinephrine can stimulate vasodilation, um, allowing more blood flow to, to musculature, so for a flight and um, fight situation as an autonomic response is what you need. You need good air transfer, so beta adrenergic receptors, um, stimulation by epinephrine or epinephrine causes bronchiodilation, so you get better oxygen transfer, and again, good for um, the fight or flight response. You get in, end up getting breakdown of glycogen and formation of glucose released into the bloodstream, again, trying to increase um, fight and flight response. And <clears throat> each of these functions in the, in the heart or the lungs or the liver and vasculature primarily target certain beta isoforms, beta adrenergic receptor isoforms. We'll say the heart, for example, is predominantly regulated by the beta 1. Lungs, the lung bronchodilation is largely regulated by beta 2 ion. But there certainly are other other um, um, responses in these uh, sympathetic response that can activate other beta, beta isoforms. 
But I'm going to start off talking about <clears throat> regulation of the beta-2 receptor in your lungs. Why? So if you look at the top 25 drugs, again, this is a little bit old. This is about five years old. <clears throat> and this is the top 25 ranked uh, or listed by sales. And what you may notice is that many of these drugs target G-protein coupled receptors. These are, the, these are the receptors they target. But what you also may notice is that many of these, four of these, actually are, are, are treatments for asthma or congestive uh, obstructive uh, pulmonary diseases, but mainly asthma. And three of them target the beta-2 agonotergic So these are the top selling drugs on the market. So, so why asthma? Why is asthma so uh, popular? Or so, so popular for treatment. So asthma, as many of you already know, is a, is a constriction of smooth muscle forming bronchioles. And that decreases uh, the amount of air flow into the lungs. And it can be caused and triggered by many things, particularly allergies, um, environmental triggers, exercise, colds. And it's a huge problem worldwide. It's estimated that about 300 million people currently have asthma or some form of asthma. And it's increasing every decade. In North America, while it's less of a problem worldwide, it still causes many, many visits to the emergency room per year. And <clears throat> a lot of the countries throughout the world that are largely affected by asthma are, are the uh, lower economic, uh, uh, lower income brackets, and uh, it's been quite, quite severe. What's also interesting is that a lot of the uh, emergency room visits, you can see in this bottom panel, uh, it's colored for its concentration of emergency room visits, end up correlating very well with, with uh, pollution. Uh, air pollution, particularly matter. So here's a relatively recent um, uh, assessment of the uh, particulate matter in, in, in the world. And you can see that all these countries basically at the equator have the highest particulate matter and also the highest asthma issues. So current treatment for asthma, um, it's very, uh, very common and many of you may even have this um, drug, albuterol, using it. It's an inhaled drug. It's, um, it's a beta agonist. And um, remembering, of course, that uh, albuterol, or um, the beta adrenergic receptor agonist, can, can, has the possibility of activating one of three isoforms, or all three isoforms. There are side effects, like many drugs, there are side effects of albuterol. And as I said, many of you have taken, may have taken albuterol and experienced some of these side effects. And it turns out that the major side effects end up being a result of activating the beta-1 adrenergic receptor. You're trying to target the beta-2 adrenergic receptor, but you end up having systemic really um, um, activation of the beta-1 receptor example, in the heart. So even though you're taking this drug in the lungs, and primarily it's getting into the lungs, it can also escape and get into the vasculature and um, promote uh, all these side effects. So the goal, therefore, from a, from a drug development point of view, is to create what we call a short-acting beta agonist, a SAVA, and you want to make this very beta-2 selective so you can decrease the, the activation of beta-1 therefore decrease um, some of the side effects associated with albuterol. So how do you do that? As I showed you before, the sequences um, of the receptors are very, very similar in the transmembrane domain, the primary site of, one, uh, of uh, binding of things like epinephrine and norepinephrine. In fact, the residues in the TM domain that contact epinephrine and norepinephrine are um, are identical among the three isoforms. 
So I'm going to go back um, a, couple, a couple of years, well, actually 40 years, and tell you, um, go back to the a little bit of the history of studying the beta adrenergic receptor. And some of the early studies were done by classic pharmacology using uh, radioligand uh, binding assays, in particular the competition assay. And so here you would take a tritiated probe, or it could be an iodinated probe, but a radioactive probe, and you would incubate it in the presence of um, a hormone or ligand, your competing ligand, and, and try to assess the binding of this hormone or ligand indirectly by seeing how much of this tritiated or radioactive probe is binding to the receptor. And then you would remove the uh, free or non-bound receptor to isolate um, all the, the bound receptor and you, you can count the amount of um, binding you have of the probe by a scintillation count. It's a very classic and it's still used this day and a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about today is actually going to be using a very similar radioligand binding assay. It may not be for a competition, it may be kinetics, but the principle is the same. That you're incubating with a tritiated probe, you're filtering it, and you're only looking at what is bound to the receptor of the probe. So here's a study, it was one of the classic studies, and it was really representative a series of studies that were done back in the 70s and late 70s, basically, that actually first described um, G-protein coupling to receptors, and in fact, were part of the, the term GPCRs, or G-protein coupled receptors. So in this uh, example, this is done by Mike McGuire, when he was a, a postdoc with Alfred Gilman. And what Michael was able to do is, is take a tritiated probe, an antagonist, and incubate it with a beta adrenergic receptor, and he did this in the presence of varying cold ligands. In this case, in the first case, he did it without prenolol. And what he did, what he was observing, is a very nice inhibition of tritiated probe, uh, the antagonist, without prenolol, and it, it, which is an antagonist, and it inhibited the tritiated probe very nicely, 100%, and it did it basically over two log units. But importantly, this antagonist was insensitive to one nucleotide. So if you repeated the same experiment but added in a non-hydrolyzable analog, GMP, PNP, the curves are basically superimposing, meaning that whatever you do to the G protein over here, it doesn't seem to have an effect very much on alpha analog, an antagonist. But of course, that's very, very different than in competition with epinephrine. Here, epinephrine it's able to displace or compete with the tritiated probe or the iodinated probe antagonist. But the competition occurred over many log units, in fact, about four log units, suggesting that maybe epinephrine is binding to multiple states and able to displace uh, this, this uh, radioactive probe. And what Michael did is he repeated this experiment, but he included guanine nucleotides. And it dramatically changed the shape of the curve. The inhibition curve was still complete, or more or less complete, with this concentration range. The shape of the curve looked very similar to the antagonist of Prenlaw. And it seemed that whatever this high, potentially high binding site, high affinity binding site was for epinephrine, it was totally obliterated by adding guanine nucleotides. And really, this was um, the primary reason why they thought that this high affinity binding site was due to coupling to G proteins and that it was guanine nucleotide sensitive. And so the high affinity binding site was the coupled form, whereas the low affinity binding site was the uncoupled form. And you could do that, you could stabilize that by artificially uncoupling the the G protein from the receptor with a non hydrolyzable analog. So that was sort of the basis of, of, of high affinity binding, agonist binding, but also the basis for G protein receptor coupling pharmacologically. So I've been fascinated by this curve. I was fascinated by this curve when I was in graduate school, trying to explain, trying to figure out how this could occur um, structurally. So many, many, many years later, um, 
through studying the receptor, we are able to uh, solve the crystal, uh, the crystal structure of the beta adrenergic uh, receptor bound to the heterotrimeric G protein and bound in its agonist form. And we learned a lot from this structure in comparison to the more inactive structures or the G protein uncoupled forms. This is, of course, a work, work with the collaboration of Brian Milner at Stanford, long standing collaboration. This morph sort of I'm, and I apologize for a lot of the structural biologists who may hate morphs, but um, it's very, they're very nice for um, visual aids because what they're able to show in three dimensions, the structural changes that um, could occur between um, receptors, in this case, morphing between the inactive and active form of the receptor and also the G protein. And so some of the high things you may notice is the six transmembrane domain moves considerably, uh, considerable amount. In fact, it moves about four angstroms, displays outside, outside toward the membrane. And in its place, the C terminus, the G protein here, is able to, to bind. So you need this C terminus, this TM6 to move in order for the G protein C terminus to bind. And this is one of the principal parts of activation. Sorry, I'm not going to have time to, to talk to you about what this represents and how that ends up activating the G protein. But what I would like to do is just really focus on what happens on the receptor. So you get pretty dramatic changes on the G protein side, which end up um, having simultaneously simultaneous changes on the hormone binding side. You can see at the top of the receptor. Lots of things going on in the bottom of the receptor, but simultaneous things happening at the top of the receptor. And we think that this um, um, this is the large basis of the Alice theory that Mark McGuire and all had seen, and many others had seen when looking at radio ligand binding acids, the effect of G proteins on hormone. We're also inspired by this really interesting molecular dynamic simulation, in this case by, by Ron Jor when he was working at Dean Shaw Research Institute in New York. And what Ron was able to do is to uh, perform a, an all atom um, long time scale simulation looking at alprenolol binding to the receptor. And what he observed was really interesting in that alprenolol seemed to get stuck in binding when in trying to get to the orthosteric binding site, this, the site that epinephrine binds to. It seemed to get stuck in this vestibule. I'm just going to play it again. A friend lost binding, but it gets stuck in this little vestibule. And it takes a little bit of time before it actually dips into the orthosteric binding site. And we came up with a really simple model to maybe explain how receptors can be activated by, by or regulated by G proteins and how it can be affected by this one. So in this cartoon, we have a receptor sitting in the plasma membrane could be pre-associated pre with the G protein. But more, most importantly, the receptor is sort of in its, what we call the open inactive form. And so that it's able to receive ligands, in this case, isoterinol, but it could be an agonist of epinephrine. But it's able to bind very quickly associate very quickly, but also it can dissociate very quickly. And we feel that this conformation of the receptor, the uncoupled form, represents the high, the low affinity binding site that Mike McGuire and others had seen many, many years ago. But since isoterinol or epinephrine is an agonist and it's able to activate the receptor, or I should say stabilize the active populations of the receptor, it allows for G protein coupling. G protein coupling, uh, as many of you know, involves uh, the release of GDP from the G protein. Well, this key step in the insertion of the C terminus into the core of the receptor, remember TM6 moves away and the G protein C terminus interacts, that conformational change translates across the membrane and stabilizes what we call the closed active conformation, forming sort of a lid over the orthosteric site. And that 
simultaneously um, slows the dissociation of, of your agonist, in this case, in this journal. And we think that it's this confirmation, which is the high affinity confirmation, that Andre Guillaume seen back in the 70s. So a very talented graduate student decided to actually test this hypothesis. So what he did was he took purified receptor, reconstituted in the lipid, ate pyrase, treated it to get rid of all the nucleotides to make sure that the receptor, the G protein was nucleotide proteins, and he made this beautiful complex. And they decided to look at binding of alcranolol and antagonist. Well, this is a purified system. We know how much receptor is in our test tube. And when he got the results, when he was getting the results off the counter, the sequentiation counter, he was really disappointed because he thought his experiment failed because he got very, very little bite. But what he had also done, the second part of the experiment, was to repeat the saturation curve in the presence of non hydrolyzable guanine nucleotides to see if he can uncouple the G protein from the receptor. And when he did this, it dramatically changed the binding profile. He was able to recover all the binding sites for alkanolol to And what these data suggested is that when you fully couple the G protein from the receptors, so the G protein is this nucleotide free form, ligands weren't able to access the beta adrenergic receptor. Saw no and some of this explanation for those results came from looking at carefully at the structure. And so this is another morph. It's going to morph between the inactive and active forms of the beta receptor. But I want you to focus on these two aromatic residues, the tyrosine 308 and phenylalanine 193. And you'll notice that when you form the active confirmation, that these, the positions of these change quite dramatically. So here's the morph in the active compared to the inactive state. It's a little bit easier to see, in fact, in the, uh, in the surface representation. Really, when you form the, the, the closed active state, you form almost a lid over the orthosteric binding site. And really, um, this, this provides sort of a structural uh, model for how it would slow the dissociation of a ligand and therefore uh, account for some of the uh, some of the cooperativity we see. And so Brian uh, DeVry, this very talented postdoc, together with a uh, well, graduate student, together with that other graduate student, Jake Mahoney, went back to the radial ligand binding assays, but instead of looking at equilibrium assays, they uh, looked at the kinetics of binding. And we are also able to use, rather than G protein, we are able to use a nanobody that functionally mimics and structurally mimics uh, the G protein. In this case, the nanobody is called NB80. And so what NB80 can do, because we can force it onto the receptor, is basically stabilize the, the active closed confirmation. And so what Brian thought is if you activate it to stabilize the closed active confirmation, it would slow binding of the tributary probe. It would have poor access to the orthosteric site. And also, what you can do at the same time is pre incubate the receptor with tritiated probe, the antagonist, and then throw on high concentrations of this nanobody in the 80 to see if you can form this lid stabilized by the nanobody. All as a minimum for G proteins. And so here are the data. So here's a time course for the association of beta adrenergic receptor. Um, and uh, <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, this is uh, with G protein, not nanobody. This is actually the same data I showed you before, but basically, this is um, with and without one in nucleotides. So when you uncouple the G protein from the receptor, you get lots more. Alprenol binding is a function of time. So Brian was able to do exactly the um, same experiment, but with nanobody. What he did is he pre-incubated the receptor with 10 micromolar nanobody, which mimics the G protein. 
and is seen to decrease the amount and the, the on rate of alprenolol binding to the beta receptor. It also slowed the dissociation. So here in the control is the receptor alone, but if, if you, and you, this is the off rate of alprenolol, but if you um, following binding, you add in high concentrations of nanobody, you can pretty well slow down the off rate of the tribute pro. Uh, what's also interesting is that um, these two aromatic residues that I alluded to, this tyrosine and phenylalanine, um, maybe we think responsible for, for, uh, for this lid formation and gaining, uh, affecting the access to this binding site. And so what Jake and, and Brian were able to do is to make that mutation and look at alprenolol. And lo and behold, in the tyrosine to alanine mutation, when you take away only one arm of this lid, MD80 had very little effect on slowing the on rate of alprenolol. And what's interesting is uh, uh, agonists, even agonists, so this was an antagonist, alprenolol. And here's the on rate of an agonist, tridated formoterol. And tridated formoterol access to the binding site was dramatically affected by an antibody, sort of like the antagonist. But if you did that in the mutant, it actually sped up the on rate of an agonist. So we like this model, and it seemed to make a lot of sense terms of uh, explaining some, explaining the differences between GPO decoupling and non-coupling alloys there. And it was, <clears throat> the concept was helped a little bit by um, really interesting pharmacology on the dopamine D2 receptor. So this is a structure that we uh, recently published in collaboration with Dan Rosenbaum, UT Southwestern. We're able to solve the structure of the dopamine D2 receptor as a complex with GI and, and beta gamma, but do that in a phospholipid bilayer, in a nanodisc or reconstituted high density lipoproteins. And there were striking differences, and I'm sorry I don't have time to talk about really interesting differences that we observe in the structure of the, beta, of, uh, the dopamine receptor in lipid compared to in detergent. But, um, the point I wanted to get to is that we are able to stabilize this complex with a really interesting ligand called bromocrypatine. I'll show it to you in a second. Here's the basic structure we use the nano, uh, an antibody which stabilizes the interaction between the G protein alpha subunit and beta gamma. It's a very commonly used antibody used in, for cryoelectric microscopy, structural biology of G protein receptor, G protein complexes. Um, here are some of the uh, sort of key features. Uh, you can check the paper that was published a couple of months ago. And I'm sorry, uh, again, I don't have the time to, to, to talk about its uh, structure. But what I really want to um, focus on is the interesting ligands that were, we used uh, to, to stabilize that complex. So here's the structure of dopamine very similar to epinephrine and norepinephrine, so it doesn't have this hydroxyl on the top. And uh, if you look at other dopamine receptor agonists, such as pergolide or bromocryptine, you can see a very similar structure uh, of, the, of the agonist binding site in comparison with dopamine. So here's pergolide and then here's uh, bromocryptine. What you may notice from this, uh, at least from bromocryptine, is that has this huge appendage attached to it. It's, it's, a, it's a cyclic tripeptidyl group that's attached to the um, basic monoamine structure of dopamine. And by putting this appendage, it not only uh, improves its selectivity somewhat for the dopamine D2 receptor, it's not that selective with the D3 receptor, but it's, open, it's a little bit more selective for other receptors. But it also improves its affinity of the ligand. So here's the structure of the of bromocryptine banded site. 
And here there's those aromatic residues, which would be in the, in the beta-adrenergic receptor. Um, this is the top view, and here's the side view. And what you may notice is that this, even though it's an agonist G-protein coupled structure, that this lid is not formed, not like the beta receptor. And if you, um, so the two residues are isoleucine 184, and it's a very conserved um, tyrosine. And here's the surface representation. You can see right into the orthosteric binding site, bromocryptine seems to stabilize this conformation where it doesn't appear to have a lid. And uh, I've just for, for um, display purposes, I've superimposed the structure of, of those lid residues that are present for the beta-2 adrenergic receptor. And you can see that they're quite different than this D2 structure, the bromocryptine structure. And again, here's the superposition. You can see that for the D, for the beta adrenergic receptor, there is clearly a lid that's formed, but it's clearly absent for bromocryptine bound to D2. This is just a side view. Um, here are the aromatic residues. And this cyclic tripeptyl group seems to extend out of the orthosteric site and extend into the vestibule. And what we think it does is actually pushes, by binding to this, this um, vestibule domain, it pushes these uh, tyrosine, this tyrosine and, and the isoleucine out of the way. So what does that have to do with, with G-protein coupling and, and measuring G-protein coupling? Well, here's a very old study um, done by Philip Strange. What he did is he used radial ligand binding assay and he screened a whole bunch of different types of agonists uh, on competing with Tridatus Pipper on the antagonist. And what you may notice is that pergoli and dopamine seem to inhibit spiperone binding. And it had that same biphasic shape of a curve that Mike McGuire and Antoine de Leon had observed many, many years ago for the beta 2 adrenergic receptor. And they knew that this high affinity binding site that was stabilized by pergolide and dopamine could be um, uh, affected by adding guanine nucleotides and that it would get rid basically get rid of the high affinity binding site. But look at bromocryptine. Bromocryptine doesn't, is not sensitive to guanine nucleotides at all. It doesn't have this high affinity binding site because it can't form this lid over the acrocyte because it, it's, a bi it's a bivalent ligand and pushes those lid residues out of the way. So we've seen some molecular dynamic simulations in the beta-2 adrenergic receptor. We have some structural information in the beta-2 adrenergic receptor and we have the dopamine receptor. And now other laboratories have done some molecular dynamics or some, um, different GPCRs, and they seem to observe some very similar um, uh, characteristics. And the ligands, when they bind, seem to get trapped in this vestibule before they can get into the steric site. And there's, there are residues that sort, form sort of a lid or the active site. So here are two different simulations on two different GPCRs, the M3 and the M4 receptor done by the one and more labs. And you can see how they got trapped above the, or with the allosteric site, I mean in the vestibule, before they ended up getting, uh, resolving in, in the orthosteric binding site. Okay, so, uh, what does that have to do with the lungs and, and the beta adrenergic receptor? Um, one of the interesting things is that each of these um, receptor activations, whether it's regulating the heart, the lungs, the liver, the vasculature, they seem to do so in a receptor subtype specific manner. And they seem to do so, they seem to be activated in a hormone dependent manner. Now, both epinephrine and norepinephrine are released by the adrenal glands into the system, into the vasculature. But what's interesting is that it's primarily epinephrine, for example, that's activating um, beta, beta adrenergic receptors in the lung and 
causing the autoimmune lesion. And it's mainly norepinephrine in the heart that's activating the A1 adrenergic receptor uh, to cause chronotropy, hypertrophy, and hypertrophy and dramatropy. So not only is there recept differences in receptor expression, but also there are differences in, in being able to identify the hormone. Now they're both being released, but why is the heart sensitive to beta one? Why are the and and norepinephrine, whereas in the lungs they're only sensitive to epinephrine? So we think that the vestibule has a lot to do with this. Uh, we know the vestibule is important for designing drugs. It's a target for allosteric modulators. Here's the structure. Um, with an allosteric modulator bound to the muscular M2 receptor. You can see it binds, this modulator binds in an isoform dependent manner, and it <clears throat> binds to this site that's above the orthosterics binding site. We recently saw the structure in collaboration with Brian, Brian in the book is lab, of salmeterol, which is a mitopic ligand. It sort of looks like epinephrine. It actually sort of looks like alprenolol. But it has this long appendage in orange that dips, gets out of the orthostatic site and actually gets into the vestibule. So the vestibule is important, and we think that it may be responsible for some of the differences in beta 1, beta 2 C activity. So I want you to focus on this left panel here. This is simply a competition binding assay, and we're comparing epinephrine binding to the beta 1 and beta 2 receptor. And you can see the affinity of epinephrine is basically the same between two receptors. We're not, this is nothing new. These are data that have been were first <clears throat> uh, discovered back in the back in the seventies. <coughs> Excuse me. What's interesting is that norepinephrine is a little different. So norepinephrine has a much higher affinity for the beta one receptor versus the beta two receptor. And if you remember the sequence of uh, uh, similarity between the, beta, the three beta isoforms is identical for the hormone binding site. So what can be, if they have identical binding sites, what can be responsible for this increased affinity of uh, norepinephrine for the beta-1 receptor compared to the beta-2 receptor? This is just the, the sequence of them. So we were able to, in fact, solve this uh, the structure of norepinephrine bound to the beta-1 and the beta-2 receptor. And this is in collaboration, again, with Brian's lab. And what we were able to see is that, as expected from the sequence, and sequence uh, alignment, all the residues that coordinate norepinephrine binding are absolutely conserved between beta-1 and beta-2. The structures are almost super. So how can we explain the difference is an affinity for norepinephrine where it prefers the beta-1 receptor? So some of it came, again, from, from Ron Dorr's simulation, that these drugs in his simulation, even alprenolol, seemed to get trapped in this vestibule before it dipped into the orthosteric binding site. So we went back to the radioligand binding assays, but we, we did what we call kinetic competition. So we looked at the on rate of our tritiated probe, but we did it at varying concentrations of an agonist, norepinephrine or epinephrine. And here's an example of some of the data that we uh, get. Roger, uh, since you have uh, this slide, I, I have a question that bothers me, so uh, why not I will just interrupt you for a second. Sure. So the time course of these displacements are extremely slow. Yes. So how how could you reconcile this with physiology? Uh, we can't. Um, so how do you know that this is proper assay? Well, what we're what we're doing is we're trying to explain the non <laughs> non physiological results we see in the ligand binding assays with the kinetic um, response. 
You're right. I mean, we always have this problem on translating what we see in a test tube and what we see in in vitro versus what occurs in an in intact cell in in vivo. We always have that problem. But we're, what we try to do is look at the basic behavior um, and try to establish correlations between what we observe in, in, in a test tube and in, in a cuvette compared to what, what the basic pharmacology suggests in more whole cell or even, or even uh, tissue preparations. So it's known pharmacologically that norepinephrine has a higher affinity for um, uh, the beta-1 adrenergic receptor than the beta adrenergic beta-2 adrenergic receptor for things like inotropy. That's known. That's well-established. But we're able to repeat this and see, basically observe the same thing in our radioligand binding assays. And now we're trying to look at, well, what accounts for those differences? Yes, the time courses are different. This isn't at 37 degrees because we can't measure it at 37 degrees because it's too fast. So we do this at, at room temperature or slower or cooler. So you're right, um, but that's one of the caveats that we, uh, we have, but um, it's really the only way to, uh, to look at this from this perspective. So um, what in performing these kinetic competitions, we're able to see surprisingly, well, I guess it's not that surprising, is that epinephrine is able to bind very quickly to both the beta-2 and beta-1 receptors. So the on rate for epinephrine, and in fact the off rates for epinephrine, are very similar between beta-2 and beta-1. Okay, maybe the beta-2 is a little bit faster than the beta-1 receptor for epinephrine. Interestingly, when you repeat this experiment with norepinephrine, the on rate for the beta, beta 1 adrenergic receptor is much, much faster than the beta 2 receptor. Off rates are very similar, but the on rates are strikingly faster for beta 1. Or if you look at the numbers compared to epinephrine, what you would actually say is that the on rate for the beta 2 receptor is really slow. So there's something about the beta-2 receptor, which um, its structure uh, doesn't allow norepinephrine to get into the binding site, the orthosteric binding site, as quickly as the beta-1 receptor does. And um, this on rate can account, largely account for the vast differences in the affinities calculated as a function of the on and off rates. You can see that norepinephrine has a much higher affinity, ten, at least a tenfold higher affinity for beta-1 versus beta-2 based on kinetics. So I'm trying to figure out what it is about the beta-2 receptor and beta-1 receptor that makes it different. We know that the ligand binding sites are almost identical. We postulated that it may be residues that form the extracellular uh, loops and the form of the, the vestibule that may be responsible for these changes. So we did a simple thing. We just made a chimera where we took the TM regions of the beta-2 receptor and put in the, the uh, extracellular loops of the beta-1 receptor and performed um, radio ligand binding assays. And <clears throat> if you look at tritiated uh, epinephrine binding to the site, uh, the affinities are about the same whether you have the beta-1 ECL or not. It's about a three-fold difference, but not that majorly but what was different um, was all was its responses to norepinephrine, maybe threefold difference. But what was dramatically different was the the, the um, binding of norepinephrine by putting in the ECL of beta one. You improved the affinity for norepinephrine. You converted the beta two receptor into essentially a beta one receptor. And similarly, if you took a beta-1 receptor and put the ECLs, extracellular loops of beta-2, you did exactly the opposite. You turn the beta-1 uh, receptor, 
inverse Poisson norm. You decreased its affinity now for norepinephrine. So what these data suggest is that it's the ECLs that are important for um, differences, at least when you measure an equilibrium um, in competition assays. But what about in kinetics? And so um, this, um, um, I failed to say that this work was done by a very um, incredible um, technician in the lab, Mary Clark, um, who performed all these kinetic studies. And so what you can see is that um, when you put the beta-1 loop on the beta-2 receptor, norepinephrine can all of a sudden really quickly get into the orthosteric binding site. It's on rate is almost two orders faster than the beta-2 receptor. It's true the off rate is, is, is a little bit um, uh, slower or uh, sorry faster when you put the beta uh, when you put the beta-1 ECLs but the effect on the on rate is huge and when you do the opposite when you take the beta-1 receptor and put the ECLs the beta-2 on you look at the on rate of norepinephrine Beta two seem to slow down. Beta putting beta two seem to slow down norepinephrine binding. So we think that the effect on the affinity is actually the effect on the on rate. And this is surprising because we normally define ligands, the affinity of ligands, by their off rate. In most cases, ligands with a slow off rate have a higher affinity. We don't really consider the on rate that much for ligand pharmacology. It's mostly the off rate. Not all cases, but in general. And we were surprised that even native hormones, endogenous hormones, could have such a dramatic difference in on rates that can account for some of the pharmacology that we observe, whether you measure it in a test tube or whether you measure it in cells. So we think that the vestibule serves sort of as a selectivity filter and it allows norepinephrine to get into the beta-1 receptor very quickly but not so well in the beta-2 receptor. And so <clears throat> we started to look at maybe why is there a difference between norepinephrine and epinephrine. You can see here the structure there's a little bit of difference. Epinephrine has this little extra methyl group. And if you look at the chart on um, the whole small molecule, there is a subtle difference between uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine. It's, epinephrine has a slightly uh, less positive charge than uh, norepinephrine. And a very talented uh, postdoc from, from Peter Gemeiner's lab, uh, Johannes Kendall, uh, started to look at the, the binding pathway uh, of epinephrine versus norepinephrine binding to the beta-1 and beta-2 receptor. And he did this first with, norep uh, with epinephrine. Remember, epinephrine is a slightly less positive charge. And here's the free energy landscape as a function of distance of binding of um, epinephrine to, and getting into the orthosteric site. And as you can see for beta-1 and beta-2, the profiles are basically the same. There's this low energy point, which is likely the orthosteric binding, uh, orthosteric binding site. And that's, but that's very different for norepinephrine. So let's first talk, look at the beta-1 receptor. You can see the beta-1 receptor, there seems to be a very low peak, of, um, low free energy peak, which is likely the orthosteric binding site for, for uh, beta-1, where it gets into the orthosteric site. Uh, there is the same peak for beta-2, but it seems that beta-2 has another peak, another low-energy site that we think is the best of it, suggesting that norepinephrine seems to get trapped in another binding site before it can get into the orthosteric site. illustrated in this. And if you look at the electrostatics of the pathway of the ligands into the orthosteric binding site, you can see that the beta-2 receptor has this little patch here. Oops. 
um, that is less charged than um, the beta 100 or 2 percent. And so we think that while epinephrine won't be affected by it because it's less positively charged and it can get into the orthosteric binding site in the beta-1 receptor just as well as it can get in the beta-2 receptor. Whereas norepinephrine, which is slightly more positively charged, seems to have a nice transition from the, from the vestibule through into the orthosteric site for, the, for beta-1, not so much in beta-2. And so to summarize um, this, I'm not going to whip through the rest of it, but I'm sure you will understand now our, our hypothesis that we think that this vestibule is very important for, um, for, in, for as a selectivity filter. It makes a lot of sense from the molecular dynamics simulations um, that things like the beta-2 receptor have this vestibule, which sort of causes problems for norepinephrine. It gets trapped in the vestibule before it gets into the steric site. And of course, this can have a huge effect on drug discovery and interpretations of how drugs work and how they bind into the steric site, um, and even hormones. So what does that have to do with asthma? So in the next five minutes, and I'm sorry, I'm going to go five minutes over and talk, but it's a really interesting project we have with the collaboration with Peter De Miner and a lot of the work I'm going to describe in the next few slides is done by a very talented former postdoc in Peter's lab, Maggie Stossel, and also Daniel Miller. So when, when we solved the structure of epinephrine, or when the structure was solved of epinephrine down to the beta-2 receptor, we knew the, 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 um, the stereochemistry of how this catechol ring and how the amine are related um, in the active site. And uh, what, Dan, what Danny was able to do was to look at the structure and, and postulate that we could stabilize this through a cyclic ring by adding two more carbons to make a, 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 a bicyclic structure. And um, hopefully by stabilizing this, and eventually we have a crystal structure of what we call our super epis, or stabilized epis, by simply adding these two carbons and stabilizing this ring. Because there is a potential for this to rotate in the active binding site. So we, we call these stabilized ligands as super cats or super catecholamines. In this case, it's super epi. So it turns out by, by making them super, we are, we are able to improve the affinity for beta 2. Something about the structure, um, it uh, produced a little better affinity for all the, the catecholamines that we tested. About a, uh, between a 5 and 10 fold difference in affinity. If we looked at cyclic AMP, when we made it uh, a super form, we were able to stimulate cyclase um, better. If you look at the GT gamma thia, we were able to improve the uh, EC50 for activation, presumably by improving the affinity using these super forms. Um, as I did mention earlier that uh, beta adrenergic receptor can, uh, can interact with the restin and promote restin recruitment. It's a very nice assay and easy assay to measure. This, done, this measurement was done by Harold Hoopner at in, in, in Peter's lab. And in response to epinephrine, you can see the recruitment of beta uh, arrestin to either the beta 1 receptor or beta 2 receptor is basically identical. But when you make it super version, all of a sudden we improve the, the uh, affinity and selectivity for the beta 2 receptor and diminished affinity for the beta 1 receptor. So we ended up improving the selectivity of a lab thousandfold, which is huge. And um, the structures are, are very similar uh, between the uh, non-stabilized and the stabilized form of norepinephrine. And what's interesting is that the structures are uh, in comparison to, to beta-1 receptor. And as I said, the binding sites are so identical. We're trying to figure out why 
what what is the structural difference between the beta one receptor and beta two receptor such that super epi prefers the beta two over the beta one by a thousand fold. One potential residue was this this aromatic residue uh, above the orthosteric signing, binding site. This is the one that forms the lid. In beta two, it's a tyrosine. In beta one, it's a phenylalanine. And in the structure, the position of that phenyl ring was a little different. We thought, well, maybe there's a, maybe this um, is not compatible with super epi binding. If you have a phenyl alanine, maybe that's the difference. Um, sorry, this is just the uh, affinity differences. So we decided to make a mutation. We turned that tyrosine to phenyl alanine. And in response to super iso, you can see that that made no difference at all. That residue made no difference at all. So even though the structure may have suggested it in the ligand binding assay, um, those responses are very different. And so we decided to look at kin kinetics again. And we looked at kinetics both in the um, chimera, but also in the uh, non-chimera. And like norepinephrine. Super epis were very sensitive to the ECL. So for super epi, if you put the ECL of beta one on, you decrease the affinity by about forty fold uh, for both epi and also six fold for, for nor epi. Similarly, if you took the beta one receptor and put the beta two ECL on, you um, improve the affinity. Of the beta one receptor, you I should say you improve the uh, yeah the affinity sorry by putting the ECL of beta two on. So we now know that the vestibule has a lot to do with the affinity uh, and the improved affinity for super epis. And on top of that, if you look at the kinetics, the kinetics are very uh, agreeable in that it seems that the super epis are able to utilize residues in the vestibule to improve its on rate and, um, and therefore affinity, just like how the receptor is able to use that to, to, to selectivity filter. We did something to our stabilized catecholamines that seemed to affect this vestibule binding. So to summarize everything that I've talked about today, we, we realize now that the major difference between beta one and beta two receptors are um, uh, in the response to norepinephrine is their differences in the on rate. And we think that the vestibules are largely responsible for the differences in these on rates. We were able to take advantage of that and also structure to create these, these super cats which stabilized it, which seem to share the same property, in fact, amplify these properties that um, they're able to um, use the vestibule to improve the affinity. And then maybe now we have, with super epi, a beta-2 selective drug, which we think may be useful for asthma. And maybe we can decrease some of the side effects uh, of, of albuterol, drugs like albuterol, um, by decreasing the capacity of binding to the beta one receptor. We're, um, we've now, uh, this is, we're negotiating, trying to work out a, an arrangement with a, a small biotech and to, to studying the uh, binding of super epis and our super cats and as a, as a potential therapeutic for, for treating asthma, similar or, or as a replacement for albuterol. So I'm going to skip this um, because I think I think the point's been hit that we think that the uh, the um, vestibule is really critical for for um, a lot of the pharmacology we observe. Um, I just like to to really thank Mary Clark, um, a really talented technician in the lab who did all the kinetics of the beta one, beta two. She she's just been champion which is well also did all the work on the super cats and and um, also Daniela Dengler she was a PhD student from Peter's lab and came to work in my lab uh, half the time 
doing pharmacology uh, at the Supercats and also a really interesting allosteric modulator that we spent time to talk about. Um, it's that. And also, uh, a lot of the work I talked about was by former graduate students, uh, Brian Giselle and, and uh, Jake Maloney, as well as a nice strong collaboration and long-standing collaboration with Kabilka Lab. The nanobodies were helped by um, Jan Steyer and uh, Els Pardon at Free University in Brussels. And then the um, beta-1, beta-2 selectivity studies, as well as the SuperCAT studies, were uh, really helped by Peter Miner's lab and Stossel Dino and Langberg and Mary Dorothy Muller, you know, and Kendall who did the MD. Um, and also um, and from Brian's lab, Chinyu uh, Zhu, a very talented graduate student, and Jean-Pierre Liu, who's now an uh, assistant professor in Tsinghua University, and also Chipeng um, Zhang funding and thank you for uh for for listening and i apologize for going over time this is uh first time i've given this particular talk so my timing is not quite right but i will uh, thank you Roger, so much uh, uh, bravo and uh, any questions anybody wants to start so I would just yep. start with this uh, super happy what you have shown. Did you do any animal study in terms of pharmacokinetics? How did these drugs differ? Yeah, we're, we're doing, we're doing that now. Yeah, we're just starting that. That's really well, exciting. It could, be, it could right. be a killer. On the other hand, we think it actually, based based on its structure, we think it may be better. Sure, and everything will be now in toxicity and and the yeah. pharmacokinetics. If that PAVE, uh, you know, if it's behaving similarly to epinephrine. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and we're looking forward to seeing the results of those studies. We anticipate that it should be as potent in vivo, it should be bioactive, um, but we don't know about the metabolism. Um, we, based on predictions, the metabolism uh, should be a little different than than um, epinephrine or albuterol. Um, like all catecholamines, they are sensitive to, to oxidation. That's the primary reaction. So we're going to face that same, same problem because they can oxidize. That's not any different than albuterol. Um, but the other metabolic, predicted metabolic uh, 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 products are suggested to be better, I guess. Pharmaca, I think the drug should last longer. Anybody else? Uh, congratulations uh, from a physician who has dealt with asthma in patients for a long time. Obviously, this kind of uh, research may bring an answer to the patients worldwide that are suffering the side effects of these drugs. Uh, my congratulations on this work. It's been a, it's sort of calm, everything sort of pulled together, basically, the structure of the pharmacology, the mechanism, um, and now I'm, I'm dying to see the animal work. Uh, we know that in isolated systems, they, they, we have preliminary data in isolated systems to suggest that they behave the way we think they behave, but we haven't done whole animal studies yet. So it may, it may fail. Uh, may be toxic and may be in vivo, but I don't think so. Jim, do you have a question? Jim. Yeah, so uh, there was a report, uh, I guess maybe eight or ten years ago, about uh, bitter taste receptors uh, in airway, uh, and some of the uh, agonists for bitter taste receptors at least in, in mice, were shown to relax the airways. I wonder if there's cross, of course, and of course the taste receptor is a GPR coupled receptor. Uh, I wonder if there's any crosstalk between um, bitter agonists uh, for the taste receptor uh, and the beta adrenergic receptors. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, it came uh, as quite a surprise when a lot of the taste receptors seem to be 
throughout the whole, not only digestive system, but a lot of the, uh, basically the body and not just the tongue. And um, I don't think that there's a interaction in terms of an oligomeric interaction, but certainly there may be an interaction in the signal transduction pathway. So beta receptor activates GS and stimulates hormones, phenylacyclase activity and can promote you know, PKA activation and can affect muscle con contractility. Um, and it's possible that the taste receptors can uh, cooperate in some way uh, from a signal transduction pathway with the beta receptor. I think those, I think um, a lot more research is going to be um, reported on, on the function of a lot of the taste receptors and also uh, odor receptors in, right. not in their sort of prototypic uh, localization. Odor receptors are really, really interesting. Yeah, because they're so varied. Yes. The, so the biggest uh, GPCR uh, coupled receptor uh, family known, I guess. Yeah. Yes. So, okay. Yeah. No. I mean, those are all. Those are all interesting ideas, and they. Um, the idea that GPCRs are sensors, uh, very nice sensors, could suggest that maybe in lung, one of the sensing is to sense. Um, environmental stimuli, mm. maybe particular. Um, there are other things could, that the particulates cause and inflammation that are non-GPCR mediated, but it's possible, yes. So I had a question about, it wasn't the focus of your talk, but you presented some work on the structure of the dopamine receptor. Yes. Uh, and and I, the, the specific question that I had is that in the course of doing that structure, um, you use bromocrystine to, to facilitate getting getting that structure. And, you know, my, my question is specifically about bromocrystine, um, <laughs> bromocryptine, right? Thank, thank you for correcting me. So the, the specific question is, do you see any evidence that bromocryptine is irreversible in its inhibition or binding to the dopamine receptor. And the specific reason that I'm asking that question is that it has this really unique tertiary alcohol in it that is has some really unique chemistry associated with it. It's it's tied up in this really unique hemi ketal that's also part of a hemi aminal. And I know it's a FDA approved drug and it has to go through all of the stability studies. But I'm just wondering, in the context of the dopamine receptor, if there's any possibility, you know, from my perspective, from my chemistry perspective, that it could be forming a covalent habit. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. We're obviously interested in the structure because we're interested in drug development, right? And we notice that because we're trying to make those components um, chemically, <laughs> and we understand how unstable it is. <laughs> Okay. And it's been a challenge. We've worked out a, a synthetic um, method, and, and we're, we're testing some of the compounds, but we understand it. But in terms of its irreversibility, we haven't observed any irreversibility, at least for the D2 receptor. Okay. Um, not that we know of. Um, so, Philip, bromocryptin is still isolated, right? It's not synthetic. Correct. So, yeah, it's, a, it's from a fungus synthetic or something. Yeah. It's a yeah, fungus. You, I think it's you, from a fungus, you, and then they then they yeah. do some manipulations after it comes out of a fungus. Yeah. So that, as you probably know, the chemistry uh, it's it's actually the synthesis is not trivial. Right. We have a very good collaborator at UC Southwestern um, who's been uh, really amazing in, in, in making various components, substituting components of bromocrypt. Uh, We're very interested in that. Now. Um, some of the structure may be different. So we, we've been focusing on the D2 receptor. Bromocryptine has a preference for the D2 receptor, but it's, its preference isn't great. It can bind into a lot of receptors with lower affinity, but it can still bind. And it's possible that its confirmation in the bound form may be different with other receptors. And that for other receptors, it may
may be more susceptible to um, to form a covalent adduct with your son. Mr. Hong, are you there? Yes. Uh, yeah, I have a. What do you What do you think? Can you synthesize this gram of krypton uh, over the weekend? <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> Those are very, really, very really difficult. Alkaloids are very complicated molecules. I was wondering. I do have a question about uh, your electrostatic uh, electrostatic properties of norepinephrine versus epinephrine, and I was wondering if those differences could also be reconciled by minor, uh, small, seemingly small PK differences between primary and secondary amines. Yeah, that's that's possible. We we, we thought about that. Um, it's a very good point and and uh, hard to measure. Um, in the molecular dynamics calculations, uh, sort of, tight, tight, or Jonas uh, Jonas sort of took that into consideration that that could be a, an important parameter, um, but. Overall. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, I know that the differences between amines they have very minor differences. But I was wondering, since it's a bit more al alkylated, perhaps uh, the PK yeah. might rise with going from uh, Nora P to P. Yeah, it, it's a good point. I mean, we we um, we we don't really know. This so is John, like, John, John, go, get, on, get on the synthesis of this compound. Uh, we wanted just to make sure you can do it over the weekend. But let's move on. Uh, I would suggest maybe a question from Philip and then the final comments from Sahil. Roger, it was a really wonderful talk. You know, I, somebody, you know, this is really cool that you guys are getting this fundamental question, right, of, of, of how you know, how there's this difference in beta receptor affinity of, of norepinephrine, you know, it's, it's a question every time you lecture about this, the students ask about it, how this small structural difference leads to such a big difference in affinity. So I was really impressed by that you guys were able to get some answers to that. Um, following on two questions really quick, John, following on John's question, if you tack on another methyl group, and I've never, I didn't even know this compound, but I looked at up, methadrine, and so you have a, tertiary amine. Uh, have you guys looked at that? I guess that would further modulate the, uh, the charge distribution and probably the PKA of the amine. Um, and then the second question is, I, 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 I think I missed it, but with your super epi, does that increase, did that compound have increased affinity as well for beta 2 receptor? Yes, it did. And, and the, the reason why I was asking about that is, you know, I guess as you're well aware, I guess there's a, you know, <clears throat> concern about that, that if you have something with too high affinity, that you end up down regulating your beta 2 receptors, and that can cause some issues with, uh, you know, treatment with a beta 2 agonist and, and losing, you know, obviously responsiveness to those drugs. That's a, that's a great observation. And in fact, um, let's see if I can put up this slide. To answer your first question, uh, isopterinol is is that molecule that has an extra methyl group on it, um, and it, it has uh, little selectivity. But when you make it super, it's, it has a slight preference for oh, beta. Um, hold on a second. But to answer your second question. Um, I'll, I'll just show it to you. Uh, I don't have the exact slide. Uh, can, if you can see my screen, 
So um, epinephrine, norepinephrine, isopaterenol, they, in the catechol ring, there's a single carbon with this hydro hydroxylated carbon um, on the ring. So this is actually forms the catechol. Albuterol, which is actually a partial eye, the one that's used in, in, in asthma, as well as salmeterol, which is also a partial eye, it's used in asthma. These are two of the top selling drugs in the have an extra carbon here. And that makes it a, a partial agonist. And so we've made uh, partial agonist forms of super epi. Where, where we've put an extra carbon. Uh, actually, I think it's, yeah, it's this one here to mimic albuterol and that lowers the uh, affinity for beta 2 it's still it basically right shifts both the beta 1 and beta 2 dose response groups but it should help a lot with your pharmacokinetics i guess yeah that's, that's actually the drug we're, we're more interested in So again, you know, going into animal studies is, is much more complicated and we're um, doing a lot of the cell-based studies, uh, trying to get an estimate of what we think the behavior would be in animal studies. Um, we're trying uh, to complete our studies of our perfused uh, isolated organ studies. Those are also long and, and tedious. It's funny, I used to be, my father was a pharmacologist, uh, actually a physiologist, cardiovascular physiologist. And as a kid, I grew up in the lab doing isolated perfused organ preparations. And I remember studying isopaterenol and the effects of adrenaline and noradrenaline on, um, on inotropy. And I, when I was younger, I even set up a Langendorf preparation by myself. I used to do the experiments because I used to think it was fun. Maybe a lot of kids wouldn't think that was fun, but I thought it was fun. And so it's it's a funny uh, thing to come back now and, and to actually develop drugs. And my dad would be uh, would be very interesting. He passed away, so, but he he would be intrigued by this. Okay, Sahil, your, your turn. You're speechless. All right. Thanks, Chris, for the opportunity for the last question. Roger, it was a great presentation. Uh, my name is Sahil Gulati. Uh, being very kind of a baby in the GPCR field, I do have a question in continuation with what Chris asked about the affinities of uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine. I see that uh, they should be like approximately nanomolar. And I was hoping, physiologically speaking, do you think it might be the lipids that you are using in, their, in your experiments that is causing the affinities to be a little lower than they should be physiologically? I'll be uh, glad to hear your response here. Yeah, I mean, um, that's a really complicated question. Uh, for circulating, circulating uh, catecholamine concentrations, yes, they could be a very nanomolar or, or tens of nanomolar concentration in the periphery. The behavior receptors in, in a synapse, so we've been talking about the peripheral vasculature concentrations as sort of a, as our model, but many, many GPCRs are, are located at synapses and release of catecholamines or release of hormones is not nanomolar it's almost millimolar concentrations, which is good and a bad thing. Um, um, but those are situations where you want very rapid, rapid responses. So what, what, what you're getting at though, is whether in our system, we are um, not seeing the same, exactly the same pharmacological profile as one would predict based on in vivo assays because of the circulation problem. There are many factors. Um, when you start uh, when you start 
homogenizing cells, you isolate receptors that are at the plasma membrane, you isolate receptors that are at, uh, in endosomes, you isolate receptors that are um, distributed at different parts of the cell, and you homogenize them together, and you get a crude uh, 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 culmination of a lot of receptors in different conformations. When you look at in cells, you're basically only looking at cell surface receptors from, from a short time perspective. And often in cellular assays, um, they, they are more sensitive in terms of their uh, dose response curves than, than in radio ligand binding assays. Some of the properties are due to accessibility um, because they only, they only access the plasma membrane fraction of receptors that are immediately localized with their signal transduction pathway. So it's optimized to do, to perform activity. And that's only going to be enhanced in, a, in an in vivo, in vivo setting where you have you know, the right native receptors coupling to the native G proteins, coupling to the native signal transduction pathways. And um, so you're always going to see differences in responses on in vitro systems versus in vivo systems. Now, whether there are differences in things like lipid composition, cholesterol, sphingolipids, sphingomyelins, um, different charge groups on, on head, head group charges on, on the phospholipids, they can have a profound effect on, more of a profound effect on the receptor rather than on the ligand. So um, we, we've known for many, many years that cholesterol, for example, can, can stabilize specific conformations of, uh, of GPCRs. It's, it's sort of a general broad statement, but it's in general, it's true. And so just by stabilizing the receptor, you're going to change the pharmacology. Uh, one of my big things um, in my career is trying to get away from studies and detergent my cells because the the, the, uh, the the perturbation of the detergent, the effect of the detergent on perturbing the activity of the receptor is dramatic compared to that of lipid. In fact, there's a study that, that my lab had in collaboration with Chris's lab on, on um, studying rhodopsin and the activation of rhodopsin. And by putting it in a lipid environment, you basically restored a lot of the activity and the, the, the kinetic properties of, of, um, of um, rhodopsin coupling to transducin. And so the lipid has a profound effect on, on uh, receptor conformation. I've been a little bit critical of the field in general on trying to solve structures, particularly in cryo-electron microscopy in detergent micelles and drawing a lot of conclusions about how certain uh, ligands can stabilize specific conformations based on detergent micelles. Because the detergent micelle itself can have such a deleterious effect on structure. This is one of the reasons why my lab actually hasn't been that engaged in a lot of the trial work in, in, uh, on GPCRs in detergent micelles. I'd rather see it in lipid. And so our D2 structure, which told us a lot of really interesting things, and I'm sorry that I don't have time to describe some of the interesting things we, we observe, is very different than in detergent micelles. And so, and, and a lot of it is actually the head curve, also lipid head curve, which is not observed in, in detergent micelles. So, and, and the phospholipid head group differences are some of the major differences that you see in in vitro and in vivo and cellular systems. So it's a really important point, but um, we don't think that, it, that the, the, the lipid environment affects the ligand so much. We think it more affects the receptor. Exactly, yeah. All right, Roger. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, and hopefully we will see each other in person one day. Yes, we're not very far away from each other now. Perfect. Thank you, thank you. Bye-bye.